Good morning, Malvern Methodist Church family, and welcome to our pre-recorded service. As many of you recognize, we've been having lots of challenges adjusting to this new technology. We've been having challenges with uploading things on time. We're having challenges with having to do things in installments. I'm having a lot of challenges. As I've said many times before, I am not very technical, and it is a bit of a challenge preaching to an empty church to two cameras. I'm having even more challenges dealing with online meeting things like Zoom and Skype. Uh, part of my challenge is I like to read stuff before I do it, and there are very little written instructions, and when they are written, they often have errors. And in these times, there's no one to talk to, there's no one to call, there's no one to chat with. There are all sorts of challenges, so it's been a very steep learning curve for me, and I guess it's also for you, because I've heard many of you suggest that you're having challenges even with this online banking. You don't know how to do it. But unfortunately, this is our new reality. We are in this new place of having to do many things virtually. And I keep reminding myself what I tell Micah, my eight-year-old son, all the time. Practice makes better. If we all work together, if we all are patient with one another, if we all extend grace, we will make it through uh, these times. Practice will make better. Just a few announcements before we turn to the message this morning. Uh, I just want to let you know that Sandra is safely back. She arrived last Sunday. And we also have back with us from Barbados, Mildred. We also want to extend our condolences to her. Mildred, husband passed uh, quite suddenly uh, about less than two months ago. So she is still grieving. Also Mavis Shuraya, her husband passed and uh, his service was two Fridays ago. And again, in this new dispensation, there really wasn't a funeral service per se. There was, they were limited to 10 people in a room. So we, we want to remember to pray for them. We want to remember to pray for everyone else who is having challenges in these times. We want to remind you that our communication is still a work in progress. We're trying to reach out to you in all sorts of different ways, uh, through email, through WhatsApp. Uh, we want to be in touch with you by phone. Uh, we're still having challenges getting some sort of an online presence where you can call in for prayer services and for Bible studies. We're still trying to set that up, but we have been having no end of challenge. We are working with Zoom, but we're now trying to get some information and 48 plus hours later, they haven't responded. So please uh, be patient with us. We will, we will work on that as soon as we can. Uh, we want to talk about giving a bit. We, I mentioned the challenges with, with, uh, with e-transfers as well as any other online banking. Some of you are asking whether or not you can drop the envelopes off at the church. At this point, that is not an option. We are trying to follow the government guidelines and not have the church open. We don't want to expose anyone unnecessarily. So at this point, the option is to put it in the mail. We will be checking the mail perhaps once a week. We haven't yet finalized how we're we going to do that. And yes, there is still an option for us to come pick it up. Some of you um, weren't clear on the communication that went out last week. Monica is not the one who will be coming to pick them up. She's just making the calls and keeping the records and tra tracking things so that we can, if necessary, come to your home uh, to pick up those envelopes. And if you are one who needs help with groceries or um, pharmaceutical deliveries, we can do that at the same time. So again, this is a work in progress. We are working as best we can, and we just pray that you extend grace to us. Pray for me, pray for the board, pray for all of us as we are in this challenging time of adjusting to this new normal that is a virtual reality. Uh, all of my children, they're all 35 and under, have no problem with this technology. That's the, the world they live in, but to me, it is quite alien, and I suspect uh, to you as well. We turn to the word now. How many of us know that in the midst of our discomfort, God still speaks? God still speaks. He's not a God that is a figment of human imagination. He's not a God created with human hands who has eyes who cannot see and ears that cannot hear or an arm that is too short that he cannot reach down and touch us. So I want you to turn to someone who is next to you right now and say, God has a word for you today. God has a word for you today. And if you're by yourself, then say to yourself, God has a word for me today. Psalm 19 tells us that 
The Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It provides sight. It provides revelation. It provides direction. It provides guidance. And that is what we seek from God's Word in this time of uncertainty. A word from Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. Mark chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. And it reads, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Let us pray as we turn to God's word this morning. Father, your word indeed is a light and a lamp. It points us, it directs us, it guides us. It shows us what we must do in these times of uncertainty because while times change, you are unchanging. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that you speak to us through your word, the written word that becomes in us the living word. So as we turn to your word now, Lord, open our eyes that we might hear, our ears, our eyes that we might see, our ears that we might hear. And above all, do a work in our hearts, Lord, that this word might not simply be informational, but transformational. And it allows us to change in the midst of our circumstances that we might align ourselves well with you and your purposes for us in this season. This we all pray in Jesus' name as we say, Amen. Amen. Today's message is entitled, Rebuilding the Temple. Rebuilding the Temple. And our passage immediately follows Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. And most of us, we know the story. For the first time, Jesus reveals and allows himself to be identified as the promised Messiah. Everything that he does is fulfilling prophecy. He goes and he, he gets a donkey and he enters Jerusalem riding on, on a donkey. All of this indicates that he is the Messiah, the promised king. The people respond accordingly. They take branches and they wave them or they place them on the road or they take off their clothes and lay them on the road that he might ride over them and they shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And all of these things indicate that he is the Messiah and that they have acknowledged him as Messiah. But soon after, and most the Gospels are Slightly different in all of this because we need to recognize that back in biblical times, they did not write as we write today. They did not write chronologically. They would often write uh, thematically. So while this passage is found in all of the Gospels, they all have a slightly different nuance. One Gospel in Matthew says this happened immediately on that Sunday. In our passage, it says it happens the next day. John has it happening at the beginning of his ministry, but we all understand that this is one event that has taken place. And if we look at all that has happened on that day, we recognize what happens. Picture the scene. Jesus enters the temple courts. And what it looks like is an open marketplace. What it looks like is an open market. There are cattle, there are sheep, there is buying and selling, there are money tables where money is exchanged, there are doves, and all of these things are going on. And as Jesus witnesses it, as he sees it, John tells us that he takes some cords and he makes them into a whip. And he literally goes postal. He goes ballistic and he takes this whip and he begins to beat animals and people and he drives everyone out of the temple courts. He takes the money that is being exchanged and he flings it, he overturns the tables and he, he just basically drives everyone out of the temple courts. This is no gentle Jesus, meek and mild. This is an indignant Jesus. This is an angry Jesus. This is an incensed Jesus. So one would ask the question, why? Why does he trash the place like this? Why does he rise up? Why is he, why is he actually physically violent with some people? What is going on here? 
Because the reality is these are all legitimate activities. These are all legitimate activities in preparation for the Passover that is happening a week later. The Passover is the most important festival in the Jewish calendar. Every man who is able is expected to come back to the temple and sacrifice. So the, the sheep and the cattle are needed for the sacrifice. The money exchanges are necessary because they need local currency to pay the temple tax. Doves are necessary because doves are sacrificed in order to make people um, sacrificially clean, ceremonially clean so that they can engage in the Passover festival. So all of these are legitimate activities. So what is the issue? Why is Jesus so upset? Why is he so angry? Verse 17 provides a clue and it reads, as, so after this is done, as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is here quoting from Isaiah 56, which prophesies about the salvation of non-Jews, which prophesies about the salvation of the Gentiles, saying, these I will bring, meaning the Gentiles, these the non-Jews, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And from the onset of this prophecy, from the onset of Isaiah making these statements, non-Jews were allowed to participate in the worship of God in the temple. They were assigned a separate place called a court of the Gentiles where they could come, they could worship, they could pray, and they could sacrifice. So the issue wasn't what was happening in that place. The issue was where it was happening. Because all of these activities was taking place in the court of the Gentiles, and because they had filled the place and made it a marketplace, the Gentiles were now excluded. They had no place to worship. They had no place to make sacrifice. They had no place to pray. The only area in the temple where they were allowed was now filled with other things, and they were dis. Possessed. In other words, the right activity was taking place in the wrong place. Now when we add Isaiah 49, 6, which prophesies about Jesus' rule as Messiah, it, 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 it provides even more clarity. And 49, 6 reads about the Messiah coming, about Jesus. It is too small a thing... For you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So the prophecy is saying Jesus has come to bring salvation not just to the Jews but to everyone. And here is Jesus a week before his crucifixion, a week before his purposes on earth are fulfilled and here he walks into the temple to see those he has come to seek and to save excluded from worship in the temple. Here is people excluded. The Jews are actively blocking non-Jews from coming to worship. No wonder Jesus is irate. No wonder he's indignant. No wonder he's angry. He says that they are making his house a den of robbers, a den of robbers, by their selfish actions, by their selfish actions, for the sake of convenience, they were, they were robbing actually two groups here, two constituencies were being robbed, the Gentiles were being robbed because they no longer had a place to worship, they were robbed of a location to worship God and God was being robbed because they could no longer bring their worship, they could no longer bring their prayers, they could no longer bring their sacrifices to him. They were double robbers, robbing both the Gentiles and God. And it's interesting that in this context, Jesus is rebuking some of the very same people who just before 
had been waving these palm branches who had laid their clothes on the street, who were shouting, Hosanna to the Lord, to the King. The very people who acknowledged that he was king were now acting in a manner that was contrary to why he had come. And now he was driving them out of the temple courts, some of them with licks, driving them out of the courts. Now I believe this passage, these words are instructive for us, God's church in this season and in this hour. Today, churches in Canada and all around the world are closed in response to this COVID-19 pandemic. We cannot come together. We cannot gather. There is not a possibility of us maintaining social distance within a worship setting. How do we keep people six feet apart? It's not a possibility. We sing, we talk, we... It doesn't work. So we are now isolated in our homes. We cannot meet. And I have a couple of questions for us. I have, I have a couple of musings. I wonder, I wonder, is God using COVID-19 to drive us out of the temple? Drive us out of the church in order to make room for others to come in to have a place to worship? Is that what God is doing? I wonder if God is saying that we've gotten so caught up in our worship and all that we do around worship that we have taken up so much space that there's now no room for others to come in and to join with us. We've formed a holy club. We found that we've formed this religious clique. I wonder if God, God's heart is breaking for the nuns and the duns. The nuns and the duns. For those of you who don't know what that means, this is a term coined for people who no longer, or who have no connection to church. The duns are those who came to church, but for whatever reason, lost heart. Whether there was some issue with a the relationship, there was some, something happened when they were coming to church and they said, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore, I am done. So they're now called the duns. They're done with church. And what about the nuns? Well, the nuns are closely related to the duns because the nuns are often children of the duns. They have no connection whatsoever. They've never stepped foot in a church. They see no relevance for church. I wonder if God's heart is breaking for those nuns and duns because he sent his son Jesus to die for them and for us. And due to the action of us, God's people, his church, there's no room for them because the courts, the temple courts are filled with other activities, legitimate activities, but activities that are happening in the wrong place and at the wrong time. I wonder if God is using the COVID-19 virus to facilitate a refurbishment of his house, of who we are and what we do, a, a reorganization, a, a, a change in how we do what we do. So today as we celebrate Palm Sunday, as we <clears throat> reaffirm his lordship over us, let us ponder these things in our hearts. Let us think on these things. As Jesus' body, he is the head, we are the body. As his body in the world, we are called to be his hands and his feet his ministers and his messengers, his ambassadors. We're called to continue to let our light shine that it may be a light to the Gentiles. In Matthew 5, he says, let your light so shine that all may see it, but give him the glory. As I said, our, our vision statement is to be a light in the community. Are we actually being the light that he wants us to be? His desire is that we decrease that he may increase. His desire is that we make room for him. So perhaps this COVID-19 is to allow him to make the room where we ourselves have not made room. So what is God wanting us to do individually and corporately? What is God wanting us to do in this, in this time of Sabbath? I've suddenly recognized that this time for us is a time of Sabbath. And what is the Sabbath for? The Sabbath is for two things. One, it is for us to 
find rest in God, but it's also for us to find rest for ourselves. I had a call with someone earlier this week and they mentioned that now that they are at home and not running up and down and busy, their health has improved. They've had high blood pressure for years, they've been on medication and now it's normal. It's 117 over something. God is using this time to allow us to get this Sabbath a time to focus on Him, focus on self, self-care. Go to Him, speak to Him, pray to Him. So I invite us to ponder these questions in our heart. What is God asking of us? What does He desire of us? What is He hoping that we should do differently? So let's go to Him. Let's ask Him because our God is a God who not only acts, but He speaks. And if you go to him and say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening, he will respond. And my prayer is that when he speaks, that our response to him would be like Mary, the mother of Jesus' response when the angel spoke to her. She said, be it done unto me according to your word. May our response be Jesus' response when in the garden he goes before God and he says, not my will, but your will be done. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you're the God who speaks. We thank you that your word is fresh. It is to us. It is for us. And your word to us today is that we need to ponder these things in our heart. Is this COVID-19 pandemic your means of cleansing the temple, of driving us out in order that when it reconstitutes, when it's rebuilt, when it's restructured, that there is now room not only for us, but for everyone else. Those who are outside of us, those who are outside of your kingdom, those who don't know you as Father, those who don't know Jesus as Savior, those who don't know the Spirit as guide. So if this is your word to us, Lord, speak. We want to hear because if as we have done today, we have waved our palm branches and declared Hosanna to the King in the highest. Then you are the King, we are the subjects, you are Lord. And what do subjects do but follow the commands of their Lord? So speak to us and give us the strength and the courage and the boldness to do as you say. This we pray in Jesus' name, as we all say, Amen. But not only is today Palm Sunday, today is the day, the first Sunday in the month, it's the day we approach the Lord's table. So we are going to do this for the very first time. We're going to do virtual communion. We have the elements here, but the expectation is that you would have your own grape juice, you would have your own bread or cracker or wafer with you at home. And if you need to get it, then just pause this video for a moment, go get the elements and then come back and join us. And what is marvelous about this table is that this table represents so many things. This table represents, of course, these elements, the bread and the cup. The bread and the cup, the cup that represent Christ's body broken for us on the cross. It represents his blood shed for the remission of our sin at Calvary. It represents what he has done for us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. These elements speak of his coming, of his advent, but it actually speaks of three separate advents. It speaks of him coming in the flesh over 2,000 years ago, but it also speaks of a second coming at a time and a place when only the Father knows when he will come again in all of his glory and his kingdom will be fully established, a time when there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more COVID-19, no more stress, no more distress, there'll be no more tears, his kingdom will be fully established and all will be well with us. So that's a historical coming and one that's in the future. These elements speak to that. But they also speak of a third coming, of him coming into our hearts and lives when we invite him in. So for those of us who have waved the branch and said, you are king and Lord, we have accepted him into our lives and we celebrate that at this table. And his invitation is, for all to come, for all to come. He says, there's only one thing that will disqualify you from partaking of these elements, and that is sin. Why? Because these elements represent his victory, the price he paid that sin might be dealt with 
once and for all. So if there is sin in our lives against God, then we are disqualified. If there is sin in our lives against someone else, we are disqualified. Why? Because we are the body, he is the head. So he and we are one. Just as Jesus said, the Father and I are one, we are one in him. So sin against a brother or a sister is sin against God. And he says, if that is the case, don't partake. Go remedy that situation, be reconciled, get rid of the differences, ensure that there's no strife or division among us, and then come and participate. So his invitation says, come, come, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. But as we partake, there's something of a mystery that happens that we don't understand. Of course, that's what a mystery is. <clears throat> Not only do we have the mystery of the Godhead <clears throat> dying for us, how can God separate from himself from himself? How can God die? We have to believe that by faith. But similarly, as we partake of these elements, as we eat of this bread, as we drink of this cup, we believe that God uses these as a means of grace, as a channel through which he pours out his spirit into us, enabling us to live the life that he has called us to live. In our own strength, it is impossible. But he strengthens us, he empowers us by his spirit to live the life and to do what he invites us, what he commands us to do. So we come before his table today. But he says, before we come, we must allow him to examine our lives to see if there is any sin there. Otherwise, he says, some of you have approached the table cavalierly, without thought, without reflection. He says, if there is sin and you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, there are consequences. He says, some among you have, been, have gotten sick as a result. Some of you have died. So I want us to spend a few moments now allowing God to search your hearts in quiet introspection before him as we approach the table. Let us bow our heads right now. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the faithful God. Your word says that you are faithful and true and just. That if we come before you with our sin, if we confess it, if we repent of it, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we receive your forgiveness. We receive your absolution. We now can come boldly before your table and partake with great joy. So thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for absolution. This we pray in Jesus' name again, as we all say, amen. The scriptures tell us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after the supper was ended, he took a cup, just an ordinary cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, written in my blood. Again, do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And then the Apostle Paul adds, for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So let us give thanks for these elements. Father, we again thank you. We thank you for the bread. We thank you for the cup. We thank you that you have done all that you needed to do in order that we might be returned to the fold, in order that we might be Restore to right relationship with you. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So I invite us now. We're going to take the bread. We're going to take the cup and we're going to eat and drink together. So bread representing the body of Christ broken for us at Calvary. Let us eat together with thanksgiving. And the cup, representing his blood shed for the remission of your sin and mine. Let us again drink together with thanksgiving.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So as we head into the rest of our day, as we continue to reflect on God's word to us, let us go empowered by his spirit as we have partaken of these elements, but let us also go with his blessing and his benediction. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement <clears throat> and good hope, may he encourage each of us, encourage our hearts and strengthen us in every good deed and word. Let us go in God and with his grace and with his peace as we all say, amen.